Uh, so thanks for everybody being here. Uh, I suspect we'll have more and more attendees show up as we go. Um, I want to thank you, Lee, for joining us for this webinar, The Essence of Integral Flourishing. The uh, webinar is really designed to, what, what I'd, even though we're launching the course, uh, which is we'll talk a lot about uh, you know, the, the structure and the form of this uh, really amazing course that we're launching this weekend, I really hope that over the next 60 to 90 minutes, uh, you can all walk away with a really good uh, sort of takeaway value of what flourishing is, how it operates in your life, regardless of whether you uh, go deeper into the course or, or not. And I think Lee is the, the perfect host and uh, guide for this. He's worked on flourishing and taught, uh, taught flourishing at the university level for years. Um, he's also one of our beloved integral life practice uh, leaders. And uh, some of you probably already know him and have attended his sessions. So very thankful to have you here with us, Lee, and I appreciate you um, taking the time to, to walk us through all of this. Well, thanks, Robin. I would also return the compliment because uh, I'm very uh, honored that there's a place such as Integral Life where people can congregate around these, uh, these ideas of flourishing, but also, of course, the, the integral framework that helps us to to make sense of reality in a way that is as inclusive as possible and mm. is the, basically the best map that I know of, of reality, so. Yeah, and that's a really good place where we'll, we'll, we'll dive into that. So why, why and, and I'll ask you this in a bit, you know, why take an integral approach to flourishing? We'll talk about the marriage of those two models uh, in, in a bit, but to kick us off, I thought you and I have talked about this, how serendipitous, serendipitous it was that the New York Times just you know, a week ago, came out with this great article by Adam Grant. Oh, there's Mr. Corey. Hey, Corey. Hey, guys. How are you? Good, how are you? <laughs> we had to call in the experts for the, uh, the technical support problem. That's right. We were just getting kicked off. You're getting kicked off? Oh, no, okay. yeah, we were, just, we were just, get, yeah, just, getting, just getting launched there. Well, if you can make me into a panelist, I can get you going on uh, YouTube. Yeah, great. Just right click my name and then yeah, work on it. It looks like it says that you already are. I can make you a host, but you're already, it says you're already a panelist. Do you want to make? Uh, yeah, yeah, make me a, make me a host. Yeah, okay. All righty, you are the host. Corey, should we just wait or can we, can we get rocking? You can get going. This takes about 15 seconds just to spool out to YouTube. Sure. So it is catching up right now. And you should be good. Have Great. a good show, gentlemen. Uh, okay, before you do that, change me back to the host, Corey. So we don't lose the, we don't, we don't break anything more. Awesome. Great. Thanks bud. Appreciate it. Man, have fun guys. Thanks. Had to call in the, had to call in the heavy, heavy reserves. <laughs> um, so, so Adam Grant does this really fantastic piece in the New York times about, about flourishing. And he says, actually it's about languishing. You know, what is this feeling we're all feeling right now? And he names it. And it was one of the most commented on New York Times pieces of the last year. It was really interesting. Um, I don't know if any of you had a chance to read it, but I wanted to start there. So let me, let me start with a quote that, that comes from that article. Adam, Adam writes, at first, I didn't recognize the symptoms that we all had in common. Friends mentioned that they were having trouble concentrating. Colleagues reported that even with vaccines on the horizon, they were not excited about 2021. A family member was staying up late to watch National Treasure again, even though she knows the movie by heart. And instead of bouncing out of bed at 6 a.m., I was lying there until 7 playing words with friends. It wasn't burnout. We still had energy. It wasn't depression. We didn't feel hopeless. We just felt somewhat joyless and aimless. It turns out there's a name for that, languishing. Languishing is a sense of stagnation and emptiness. It feels as if you're muddling through your days, looking at your life through a foggy windshield, and it might be the dominant emotion of 2021. 
It's the void between depression and flourishing. Languishing is the absence of well being. You don't have symptoms of mental illness, but you're not the picture of mental health either. You're not functioning at full capacity. Languishing dulls your motivation, disrupts your ability to focus, and triples the odds that you'll cut back on work. It appears to be more common than depression, and in some ways, it may be a bigger risk factor for mental illness. And the good news, as Dr. Grant points out, is, is uh, it can be overcome. And of course, we know how to do it, and that's what your course is about. So, so jump off from there and, and tell, us about, tell us about that. Well, that's a great introduction, Robin. Um, I, I was also very uh, pleased that the New York Times uh, um, sort of participated in the kicking off of this course. So the course, The Essence of Integral Flourishing, it combines a large number of insights from the scientific study of human happiness, or what's called academically well-being. And the course combines that uh, scientific uh, insight with the depth and scope of integral philosophy. And throughout the course, participants are invited to engage in uh, at least 60 practical exercises designed to produce a greater sense of flourishing. Mm. Yeah. So let's talk about that. What is flourishing? Well, according to a psychologist called Martin Seligman, our level of experienced well-being, so how we feel that we're doing, depends on how well we're doing within five categories. And these five categories are represented by the abbreviation PERMA. So that's P-E-R-M-A. And I'll share my screen um, to walk us through the model briefly. So, mm. so we have indeed the PERMA model here and the P in uh, PERMA stands for positive emotion. That's basically feeling happy. Mm -hmm. And the E stands for engagement or feeling completely absorbed in an activity that we're performing, where, for instance, we lose all track of time. And the Flow. R in PERMA. Absolutely. So that's a flow state. Yeah. And we'll speak about that more later, I think. Yeah. So, um, uh, but indeed, you, we can say engagement is flow. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And the R in PERMA stands for relationships. So that's basically just feeling connected with each other in a healthy way. And the M stands for meaning or how much purpose we experience in our life. And the A stands for accomplishment or achievement. Uh, both work. And it's about the achievement of goals that are important to us. And later, uh, Seligman added uh, the letter V to the PERMA model. So in the next slide, you can see that it makes the PERMA plus V model. And the V stands for vitality or feeling fit and energetic. Mm. So Seligman very specifically defines flourishing as doing well across the categories of this PERMA plus V model. And what that means is that we're flourishing if we regularly feel happy. Uh, within positive emotion, if we regularly feel engaged, of course, within engagement, for instance, at work or during sports, and within the uh, category of relationships, if we enjoy healthy relationships with loved ones, within the category of meaning, if we experience a sense of purpose in our life, and within the category of accomplishment, if we're regularly doing things that, um, that help us to achieve goals that we find important, and of course, within the category of vitality, that we feel on a regular basis, energetic and fit. So, yeah. Um, stop sharing that. That's fantastic. Um, now, what I was struck by, I mean, I've, and I've been doing this stuff a long time, and, I, and I've, I've, I've actually done work in, uh, in, in this area, and I've, I've written stuff on it as well. And, and even knowing it, I was struck by how when I went through the course, I would reference what I would reference that model again and go, you know, I've been missing some things I've missed. Um, I've not been in flow states quite as regularly as I'm used to throughout my life. And that's certainly been true the last year and then maybe even the last couple of years. Um, I'm probably not feeling as purposeful in certain areas of my life. And so what I found was that, and this is a point I'll come back to a lot about your marriage of PERMA and integral is, is how it became psychoactive. As I went through the course, it became psychoactive. And I've, I've, I've said this to you privately is like, when you build the mind of a floor, you, you build kind of a flourishing mind, it, it pulls you towards it naturally as kind of a gravitational attractor because you start to recognize, oh, maybe I'm not feeling as purposeful or I'm actually 
not feeling as connected with my friends. And even this week, I thought, you know, I could reach out. There's, there's three or four really important women in my life that I haven't reached out to in like three or four months, like my sister, my aunt, and I'm going to pick up the phone this week and, and do all of that. So I love how that psychoactivity takes hold in this. Mm. Well, that, that is very beautiful. And I think that's one of the things that I would say the course does is that it, it encourages people to take action based on everything that we discuss and, and to identify where there's room for improvement in your own life and then to just do concrete things that make you feel better and that improve relationships and, um, and that contribute to flourishing. So uh, it's, it's wonderful to hear that, that the course is having an effect on you. Yeah, no, it, it, it is. It's really neat. And, and let's, so let's talk about that. So this is really relevant right now, isn't it? Uh, you know, we're coming at, into a, a, you know, a year of a pandemic. We've all kind of had our lives put both in stasis and, and kind of in upheaval in a lot of ways. Uh, how are we, I mean, how are we doing? What are the statistics? Are we doing well as a people? I mean, I know, you know, we're all dealing with a lot of stuff. So what, what does the data tell us? Well, it's interesting because um, the United Nations recently released their annual world happiness report. And that says that due to the COVID pandemic, average mental well-being in the United Kingdom in um, 2020 was almost 8% lower than predicted in the absence of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And that about 22% of the population reported significantly lower levels of well-being than before the pandemic. And my feeling is that as more data continues to come in, we'll likely see similar suffering in other countries, which means, as you said in the introduction and Adam Grant said, is that a large number of people across the world are indeed languishing. And I would say that if we revisit uh, Martin Seligman's, uh, Seligman's uh, PermaPlus V model, and I'll share a, a screen again, then it actually makes sense within the categories that he describes. So if we're looking at the PermaPlus uh, V model, then first of all, if we look at positive emotion, then we can say that the pandemic has left many people feeling, well, I would say much less happy and more fearful about the future. Indeed. And um, joy, joy is harder to access when you're reading the headlines we are and when you're under, under a state of fear and anxiety. I agree. And I, I would also say that, at least from my own perspective, I've been following the news much more, um, uh, much more intensively since the pandemic, just to keep abreast of all of the government regulations mm -hmm. and things like that. But that also means that I'm exposed to that 24 hour news cycle of, of basically uh, lots of horrific stuff uh, coming from all across the globe and very yeah. little positive stuff. So, yeah, yeah I agree. And um, so that indeed, as you say, joy much less within positive emotion. And then if we look at engagement, then many people are experiencing less engagement at work. So less flow states, either because they're working from home with a lot of distractions or because they've partially or sometimes completely lost their job. Or, of course, because they're experiencing increased stress levels at work. For instance, um, think of frontline healthcare workers who are working yeah. sometimes ridiculous hours and um, and not being able to recuperate um, sufficiently. Mm. And then if we look at the next category of uh, relationships, then many people have seen their social circle shrink due to lockdown measures. So that what you're de just describing about the women you haven't contacted for a while, I think that goes for many people that, um, that contacts have really shrunk. And, um, mm. And I would also say that many intimate relationships have been placed under much greater strain due to more people having to work from home, spending more time in each other's personal space. Um, sometimes, of course, with children kept home from school as well. I don't know how it was in the United States, but there was a has been a significant period in the Netherlands where um, the parents had to keep their children at home and had to school them themselves. Right. In addition yeah, we, had to the all same, we had the same effect of variously throughout the school districts uh, throughout the United States. Yeah. So that puts a lot of pressure on, on families and on relationships. And, uh, and another thing that I, I think is also very important is that many people have been deprived of physical touch due to social distancing rules. So that's um, within the context of relationships. And I would say that within the context of meaning, many people are experiencing less purpose in life than before. And that's due to restrictions, uh, restrictions in travel, uh, education, work, 
and of course, social and cultural activities. Um, so I know you just spoke about experiencing a slight decline in, in purpose that you experience. And what would be the main reason for you? Would that be also things like travel and things that you can't do that give you pleasure? Um, there's, I mean, certainly we've always been, you know, a traveling family. So it does have a big impact on us. In fact, as I said, we were living nomadically uh, right up to the week that almost all the borders shut. So we had come through four countries in the prior 30 days, just, just in that period. So certainly travel uh, is a, uh, is a big deal. And um, I'm still reflecting on what some of the other things are around the question of, uh, of purpose. I think what we have found is that as we've done things like this webinar or the things that we're trying to do with inner life with respect to like inner life practice, we've tried to adapt what we do to the new reality to be in service to people. And that has been meaningful. That has been, but there's been an adjustment as, as life changes, you sort of have to be agile enough to say, okay, what can I do to bring the purpose back to me now that things are different than the way they were before? Hmm. And that's interesting. And I, I don't know if this, this is also relevant for you, but um, in 2007, there was a large um, European study done about how people experience their well-being and, and levels of well-being were lowest measured in uh, the Russian Federation. And mm. one of the explanations that was given was that meaning is often also impacted by the degree of freedom that we experience to uh, express ourselves, to move about, to um, take control of our lives, and that more dictatorial um, governments tend to produce citizens who experience lower levels of well-being and i was thinking that perhaps within the context of the pandemic with more restrictions also from a governmental level that that might also have some impact on our experience of meaning as, as citizens of countries yeah that wouldn't surprise me for sure and and now how about accomplishment indeed so well i, I would actually add some stuff to the to the meaning also because one of the things that i uh, became aware of uh, over the last couple of years is that some people are also experiencing what's called um, climate depression and um, because of many people feel helpless to prevent what they see as the possible future collapse of the earth's ecosystems and I think many many people are also feeling existential dread about the possible oncoming uh, economic effects of, of the pandemic so so I think that's also a lot of stuff that's impacting our sense of meaning as well so um, mm, for sure yeah and indeed if we look at accomplishment then uh well many of us i think are unable to achieve the goals that, that are important to us and if if i think of all of the entrepreneurs that have been stunted in their their plans to achieve um just business goals uh, and i think that also goes for individuals and um some uh, some resources of course have also been uh, cut off uh, for people so so achieving goals has become more uh, difficult and more challenging mm -hmm. so, and also within the sense of accomplishment i would say like adam grant wrote in his new york times article about languishing is that many of us are experiencing a drop in motivation to get things done and are much less productive than before um so that's also a factor yeah, if you read some of the comments, uh, just to interrupt real quick on that point, if you read some of the comments to the Times article, there were people, people would basically say, well, my priorities have really shifted. And I don't, you know, this whole pandemic thing and, the, and all the disruption, it's really changed what I care about. I, so yes, I still want accomplishment, but it's not the same accomplishment as maybe I wanted two years ago, because my, maybe my priorities have shifted, they've deepened in some ways, they've matured. It's like, it's the old, you know, the, you know, the old adage about you build your, you build your career. If you lean your ladder against the wrong wall, well, you climb the ladder and you're still on the wrong wall. And so I think that the, I think this whole experience has probably, at least for some people, matured their sense of what's really valuable in their lives. I agree. And I, I would also say that it's possibly also contributing to a healthier uh, business climate and a mm -hmm. healthy organizational climate because for me, for years people have been saying that it, they can work from home and cut out commuting time and, and that's also a big factor in, in well-being that the uh, duration of commute 
And now, of course, organizations have been forced to um, have their employees uh, work at home and, and apparently it, it does work. So I think what you're pointing to is that, of course, the double-edged sword of, of any crisis is that it also produces some opportunities. And well, that's right. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, even though we're focusing on the negative aspects in terms of how it might contribute to languishing or not flourishing, it's also worth pointing out there's actually a lot of really beautiful, amazing positives that are coming out of it. And if, as you say, if, we, if we're able to work from home as a more, as a more uh, sort of integrated part of our work lives because of this experience and we get the freedom and we can, you know, take the work trip when we want to or go into the office or whatever, that sort of integration or synthesis of, of having that freedom plus the capability to work from home, maybe spend more time with our families, that's, that's really going to be a very big positive. And I think we'll see a lot of that. I agree. Yeah, I certainly agree. So, okay. Um, to, 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 to conclude, indeed, uh, uh, the PERMA model in relation to the or PERMA plus V in relation to the pandemic, I, I would say that if we look at vitality, then many people are feeling less energetic and fit. And um, of course, probably because many people are exercising less due to lockdown restrictions. And I know of some people who have also been eating less healthily than before. Um, Drink, drinking and, a lot more alcohol sales were through the roof. <laughs> <laughs> indeed indeed so uh, so i would say that that's that's one way we can use the perma plus v model to gain deeper insight into the mechanics of why people experience higher levels of languishing than before the pandemic yeah but indeed. on the other hand i'm sorry but on the other hand i was going to add that I, I like the way you were speaking about the positives because it's not all bad. And on a positive note, there are many people who've also been able to turn this global crisis into a personal opportunity for growth. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, of course, I've been uh, seeing also as, a, as someone who's, who's been leading the practices um, in, uh, for integral life is that many people in the integral community uh, have attended the practice sessions to invest in their own well-being. And I, I would say that's my intention with this course also is to offer people an additional option to invest in their long-term health and well-being, and hopefully to have some fun while doing so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, integral, I mean, you would expect integral life to say, oh, you know, it's, it's the integral model, it's great. Uh, and this course is um, one of the most comprehensive integral courses we've done and i know i know our our members or our, our audience might say well you know you've said that before it's true but it's also true that this one's a lot bigger like there's a lot going on here uh there's uh, we'll, and we'll get into in a, in a little bit we'll get into the just dozens of practices you've got organized through the integral model and, and the things that are inside of it but i was actually really struck just by how comprehensive the approach you took is with respect to the integral model itself. You actually walk people through, putting aside the perma for a moment, you walk people through all of these pieces of the integral model. Then of course you marry it together with perma and then you marry it together under this banner of integral flourishing. So I, I'm really curious, and I've said this to you, so I'm really curious why you did that and what you found, strengths and weaknesses of these approaches, how did they complement each other? And and um, I, I think the result was was quite brilliant. But um, I want to hear, like hear it in your words. Well, well, first of all, thanks for the compliment, and um, that that is absolutely great praise coming from someone who is so close to the heart of, of integral um, the integral community. So I I think one of the things that I bring to the to the table, and we were speaking about this before we, uh, before the call started, um, is a personality type. So I identify mostly as a personality type one within the Enneagram, and they they tend to be people who are very um, detail oriented and who like to do things, um, like to perfect things as as much as possible. So I, one of the things that I noticed while I was creating the course was that. I wanted to start from scratch. So if you know nothing about the integral model, I wanted you to be able to arrive with, uh, um, let's say, a, an open mind and then to go step by step into, the, uh, into a deeper understanding of uh, integral theory. 
And I also wanted to create it so that if you know a lot about integral theory, you still see a lot of stuff along the way that you perhaps hadn't yet seen. And, that, and that's something I think I bring just from my own life um, experience. And I've, I've heard many people say this before, but I arrived at integral theory when I was already doing a lot of um, practices uh, on my own. And I'd also done a lot of conceptualizing and thinking about um, just reality and, and how things, what's real and how reality works. And what I found was that coming to integral, it was like, oh, I, I thought about that, but I didn't think about that. And I didn't see that. And I didn't see that. And so Ken Wilber's work specifically was for me, such um, an expansion of things that I've been working on myself. So I'm forever grateful to him and, and also to people like you and Corey and everyone who's, who's helped to keep this, um, this perspective and this, this, uh, this philosophy alive and to spread it. So that's, um, so that's sort of the, the place I was coming from. And um, and I also chose a, a methodical structure because, again, I really wanted to offer value to participants, regardless of their previous knowledge of integral theory. And I'm pleased to say that earlier versions of this course have been very positively reviewed, both by newcomers to integral theory who didn't know anything uh, when before uh, they came to the course, as well as by what we could call integral veterans who, who mm. even teach uh, integral theory, but who were still able to um, gather th some uh, value from the course. But yeah, if I can interrupt on just that note, I mean, I always love, even though I know a lot about integral theory, I always love to hear someone else describe it because I always pick up some nuance or some angle of perception I didn't have before. And I think, oh, that's really smart or that's really cool. And it rounds out my own understanding of it. So even though, I mean, obviously I work with it every day, it was really neat to, to hear how you walked through it, even just by reversing some of the, the you know, the, the, the quilts, which we'll talk about here in a moment, um, that you know, very clever. It's a it's a very kind of nice way to to put it out there. Yeah, well, well, thanks, thanks very much. And I think that um, again, if we look at typology, so personality structures that we all bring to to the table, there are things that some of us can bring that others can't can't bring. And I think one of the things that integral theory um, helps us to see is that there's room for everyone, and that everyone has a piece of of the puzzle and a piece of the truth. And um, it, it's, to me, it's very um, inspiring to see, for instance, Jeff Saltzman, who, who identifies as a type five when the, within the Enneagram, you who identifies as type seven, Corey, who identifies as a type four, and Normali, who identifies as a type four. And to see all of those different perspectives and how, indeed, as you were saying just uh, uh, previously, there were just, things included in some perspectives that are not included in your own and, it, and it's right. it's a delight if you can indeed find that and i don't know if uh, because i think this is uh, interesting to mention for people that if they haven't read your piece on uh, the great release i would absolutely advise people to read that because that was one of the things that i've read that i thought was uh, i had a similar experience that i thought wow i've I, i've read uh, thomas piketty um the french uh, economist and I sort of more or less understood what he was saying, but then I read your take on him and you brought all of these other theoreticians and historians into the mix and of course framed it within an integral perspective. And economy as a concept just came alive for me more than mm. it had done before. So that- oh, That's wonderful, thank you. Yeah. So again, if, if people haven't read, read your, uh, oh. <laughs> your e ebook, I would say, please um, yeah. go read it, the great release. So. Yeah, thank you. So Perma so, V uh, marries integral and we end up with this beautiful framing device for what was the Perma V model uh, and how did that work out? Well, uh, a great question. So um, the relationship between the Perma plus V model and integral theory. So the way I see it is that the Perma plus V model provides us with specific tools that we can use to experience a greater sense of flourishing and then generally speaking mostly in the individual interior and the collective interior dimensions of life or what integral theory would call the upper left and lower left quadrants so uh, we feel 
that we're flourishing, we feel it within ourselves. So in our subjective experience, but we also uh, experience it between in our relationships with others. And of course, for those of us who are familiar with integral theory, we know that reality is much larger than those interior quadrants alone. So in a way, this course is saying yes and. Mm. It's saying yes, we can use the PERMA plus V model to increase subjective and intersubjective flourishing. And it says we can also use the integral model to ask what it might mean to flourish as a human being across all five elements of the integral model. And I'll share my screen um, once more. Um, so for, for those um, uh, participants on the call who haven't delved into uh, the integral model very deeply, uh, the, it consists of five elements. So the quadrants, the intelligences, levels, types, and states. And um, if we're speaking about moving from PERMA plus V flourishing to integral flourishing, then we're speaking about moving from a flourishing within a one aspect of reality and then trying to make it as, as broad as possible. So we include as much of reality as possible in how we're approaching flourishing. So we could say that integral flourishing is flourishing within the context of the quadrants within the context of the intelligences or lines of development. So let's say uh, multiple intelligences indeed within the context of levels. So here it would mean levels of personal development within the context of types that would here also mean uh, primarily personality types mm -hmm. and also within the context of states, which here would mean primarily states of consciousness. So I, I'm not sure whether we need to go into the integral models elements, uh, Rob, what do you think? Uh, no, well, let's dive into, let's go deeper into the PERMA model. I, I assume that a lot of our listeners will be at least passingly familiar with the integral model, but but we'll come back to that actually when we start to talk about practice, because that's where I think things get really interesting um, just in terms of the different really fascinating kind of activities that are lit up. And we'll go through a few of them uh, in viewed through the integral lens. So we'll come back to that, but let's get, let's get specific around the PERMA model. Um, and first talk about the P. So positivity, what I think of as, as joy or positive emotions. So uh, to give us some more specifics about each of these. Absolutely. So it, it's interesting that you say in the, indeed positive uh, positivity or joy. And that's actually how Martin Seligman, uh, the, um, who founded the PERMA plus V model, thinks about it. He thinks about it as positive emotion singular, as uh, indeed happiness or joy. And other psychologists such as Barbara Fredrickson, whom we'll uh, probably discuss later also, she thinks more of a range of positive emotions. But yeah. within the context of, uh, of the PERMA plus V model, it's indeed um, a positivity or joy. And um, in the course, we look at various ways to experience happiness more often. And um, we indeed, we discuss the so-called broaden and build theory, which was yeah. developed by psychologist Barbara Fredrickson, who I mentioned uh, just now. And she suggests that the evolutionary benefit of feeling happy is that we feel comfortable enough to explore new behaviors, which can increase our chances of survival. So an example of this is, for instance, when we're playing around uh, chasing each other as, as children, what we're also doing is we're also potentially training ourselves to be able to outmaneuver predators that are chasing mm. us. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we're also potentially training ourselves to be able to catch prey animals, which are trying to escape from us. So that's a really interesting perspective on the functionality of happiness. And of course, in, in addition to discussing theory, we also engage in a variety of exercises to experience joy. Yeah. And just to touch on that, that's another thing I, I would mention. Like I've read a lot of these theorists over the last many years as, as you have. And I love Barbara Fredrickson's theory. I love her concept of broaden and build. I think it's an important uh, addition to thinking about what the actual mechanics of the evolutionary process are in, in the human psyche. Um, and I just want to, I just want to, I guess, you know, compliment you on the fact that there's there's so much of good theory that you brought into the this that I I was hard pressed to find a lot of gaps and I guess that was the point of of not only bringing in perma but integral 
and then a you being as comprehensive as you are, but you know, you hit on Barbara Fredrickson stuff, you hit on Angela Duckworth stuff on grit, you hit on, you hit on strengths and why we actually need to, you, you know, rely on our strengths to go into flow states. And so I just want to say that from my point of view, this is also one of the best evidence-based, um, uh, research-based uh, courses that I've seen come actually through the integral space uh, in a long, long time. Well, so thanks. with that as the compliment, I just wanted to, to, to mention yeah. that. So let's dive into engagement. Absolutely. Um, so engagement, as you said, flow, and I think that's really, for people who know what, what flow is, indeed, that's the best description. Um, so a flow state is a state in which we um, basically merge completely with the activity that we're performing. So many of us have experienced this while working, while playing sports or while uh, interacting with a loved one, where we lose track of time and feel completely immersed in the present. Uh, and it's typically a state of trans uh, self-transcendence. Uh, self and, and speaking of course, theorists, so for those who uh, for those who are listening, this is Mihai Csikszentmihalyi's Mihai's um, uh, a really foundational concept on flow. Yeah, absolutely. So we indeed we discuss Mihai Csikszentmihalyi's theory of flow, and we also do an exercise to experience a, a state of flow. Mm -hmm. And in addition, we discuss uh, some further research by uh, Barry Schwartz and others, which suggests that the more we consider our work to be um, a calling, so a, a mission the more likely we are to experience a flow state whenever we're working. And of course, the converse is also true that if we experience our, the work we do as a job where we're looking at the clock thinking, oh, how many more hours do I have to do this? Then it's much less likely that we'll experience a flow state at work. So I, I would say that this harks back to what we were speaking about earlier, that if you can work from home, that it can sometimes be more difficult to uh, enter a flow state, but sometimes it can be more uh, more easy indeed. So I'm, I'm curious to see where this is going to go in the future with organizations and how people, how people's engagement measures when they can work from home um, in a way that they want to. Indeed. Um, and, and for those of you who, for whatever reason, decide you're not going to take the course, let me just kind of summarize the take-home value here, I think, that, that you should be listening for, which is if you want to, what this research shows, if you want to enter a flow state more regularly, what Lee said about sort of thinking about your calling, thinking about purpose and marrying that with strengths, those areas where you are sort of preternaturally uh, have some talents that stand out, you know, what, what the theorists would call signature strengths, that combination of things can really be a powerful uh, way to, uh, to, to move into flow states and to, into higher engagement. So I'll, I'll continue to try to point out like these areas that, that you can think about um, after the webinar is over. Uh, so the next, the next uh, sorry, Lee, did you want to comment on that? Well, no, I, I thought it was, that was an excellent addition. And perhaps we could even go further and say that uh, within the theory of flow, you're looking for, in the most basic explanation, you're looking for something that requires you to have a particular level of skill. So it challenges your skills, um, but it doesn't challenge them too much. So it borders right. between, uh, it doesn't produce anxiety and it doesn't produce boredom, but it, it sort of balances in between. So if you're a piano player, then you don't want to play just uh, some music that's only one note repeating all the time, but you also don't want to play uh, like something very difficult by Franz Liszt, or, or um, perhaps you just want to play something by the Beatles that suits your skills, but is a challenge enough. That's right. You... And, yeah, sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. No, it's fine. Please. So for those for those of our of our, uh, our our community members who are familiar with the human developmental models, you will recognize some of this concept from the notion of that fertile territory right at the edge of your skills that is not so, you know, that is challenging, but also you get support in order to sort of to grow. And so one of the things we talk about in human development a lot, I, and I think of it as a parent, you know, when you want your children to grow, you can't overburden them with a challenge that they can't take on. Uh, you need to give them enough support, but it also can't be boring. So there can't be no challenge. And so that that happy fertile ground right between challenge and support is a constant um, uh, sort of concept in human development itself and in the growth. 
of the growing up process and, and even waking up, you know, in your meditation practice or whatever it might be. Uh, and of course, Lee's bringing that in rightly here as being a, a really robust concept in the notion of, of, of flourishing and finding flow as well. Absolutely. So relationships, let's talk more about relationships, the R in the PERMA model. Indeed, as, as we were saying before the call, it's, that's also a very important um, domain um, for many people indeed during the pandemic. And um, within the context of relationships, we discuss in the course, the research of uh, psychologist John Gottman, um, who studied married couples and who discovered that the best way to completely destroy relationships is mm. to treat others with contempt. Mm. So naturally in the course, we discuss how to avoid behaving contemptuously towards others and instead how to nurture constructive and mutually beneficial relationships. And in doing so, we explore a number of exercises to cultivate compassion and gratitude towards people in our life. Yeah, it's so, so important. And um, of course, Dr. Keith talks about this all the time as well in, in, in the, the Wit and Wisdom uh, show and how easy it is to develop resentment over time how to develop, build up these resentments, uh, you know, especially with your, your significant other, where there's a lot of familiarity, take it for granted, your, your husband or your wife or what have you. And the resentments build. And before you know it, after three, four, five years, there's a kind of a hidden ball of resentment. You haven't even noticed that you've allowed yourself to cultivate that then is characterizing a state, frankly, a, a repetitive state pattern or habit that then, uh, comes out with, you know, the kind of th things that harm relationships, harm connection, harm a feeling of, of really uh, beautiful inner subjectivity. So I, I'm really glad you brought up that concept of both the compassion, you know, and the gratitude in, in this context. It's really critical. Well, that's well said. And I, I think of it also as shadow work because the course also mm -hmm. delves into shadow work. But um, as you're describing that process of, of things coming in between uh, in the relationship. I'm thinking of how, if you wear glasses or sunglasses, that if they become, uh, if they become <laughs> dirty, then your perception of, of what you're looking at is, is influenced. And I would say that the resentment then is a sort of a film covering the lenses of our glasses as we look at our uh, intimate uh, partners in life. And that we really need to do the shadow work to clean the lenses of our, our glasses, so to speak, to, to be able to connect from that place of, of purity or authenticity. It really, it's, yeah, it's well said. And, and it, it can be so subtle. I mean, that's the thing about this. It can be, these things can be so subtle and you're, you swim in the waters and you don't even totally see it yourself. So again, the psychoactivity of any of the work we do, whether it's this course or the stuff that we do with our shows or whatever, all of it is designed to create yourself, create a mind, an integral mind that via its psychoactivity is able to kind of self heal and to see things that are so easily missed otherwise. Um, so yeah, so I, I just, um, we'll, we'll, we'll move to meaning, but I, I, that's a really, uh, that's a really interesting one, I think. I agree. And there's so much to say about everything that we're discussing. So yeah. indeed, um... Yeah, really um, okay so meaning purpose yeah uh, indeed uh, uh, meaning and purpose uh, in, in the course we one of the things we do at least is we discuss the work of Viktor Frankl who many of you might know who was a Jewish Austrian neurologist who survived four Nazi concentration camps during the second world war and in uh, Auschwitz uh, Viktor Frankl observed that prisoners who experienced a sense of meaning and despite their horrendous circumstances, that they had significantly greater chances of surviving the camp than prisoners for whom life had lost all of its meaning. So uh, Frankel was working as a, as a camp doctor um, treating fellow prisoners. So he saw that, that people indeed just died when they, or died more easily um, when they didn't have something to hold on to. And one of the the examples he gives is of a person who was able to experience purpose because he wanted to publish an academic um, paper. So, and he was keeping sort of a, a rough version of the paper on him all of the time under his clothes. And that was just enough to sort of hold on to, um, 
to a sort of lifeline. And other people, of course, held on to the idea that they could see uh, loved ones um, whom they'd left behind. And, um, and by studying meaning within such a powerful and overwhelming context, yeah. we can then transport it to our, um, the, our lives, which of course are considerably more comfortable yeah. and, and less challenging. That's right. And then, and then we can see how we can learn from people who've done things in, under really difficult circumstances, how we can do them under less difficult circumstances. And, and we do a number of exercises that help us to uh, live as meaningfully as possible. What I love about uh, Frankel's work, so he was the founder, for those who uh, maybe don't know, he's the founder of a school of thought named Logotherapy. Um, and his, uh, his, his classic book, um, uh, man, is, uh, man's, man's Will to Choose. Uh, man's Search for Meaning was his first. Man's Search for Meaning, that's right. Um, and what I, what I like about Frankel's work was the notion of the freedom we have ultimately. It's a very existential concept coming at, largely in that time as well as a reaction to the war in the post-war period that we see in a lot of thinkers at that time, but, but sort of our freedom to choose, our freedom to ultimately hold within ourselves the commitment that makes our life meaningful and nobody can take that away. And, and what I like about what you said with respect to the hard conditions in which he was writing is we have no excuse. I mean, we, we have it great, relatively speaking. Now, not everybody around the world does. I mean, I'm, I'm clearly not counting everybody in that picture, but I can speak for myself. I can speak for most of the people I know. We've got it really good. And the gratitude to remind ourselves that we are free to choose. We are free to make a commitment that is meaningful and that, and we kind of, I mean, I don't want to make it too simple, but like, we just need to be reminded in the morning, we're free to choose to make a commitment to make today meaningful. And it's a practice and it's a, it's a habit. And it's something that we have to, uh, we have to bring within ourselves as a commitment that we try to, to do on a regular basis. Well, that is, that is very beautiful. And I, I would say that actually also applies to what we were speaking about earlier with relationships and, and resentment, because one of the things that I found is that sometimes I can feel, oh, I have to do this or I have to interact with the person so-and-so. And, and then I think, well, of course, I don't have to. I want to. Mm. And that completely mm. changes the dynamic. And then right. resentment becomes a sort of a childish game of um, I force myself to do something and then I rebel against myself uh, subconsciously. And if you remove that indeed by, as you say, becoming conscious of the fact that we, we're choosing more or less what we do, then that is um, a, a, some form of liberation indeed, yeah. That's probably a good segue. The, the notion of choice is probably a good segue to accomplishment. What's important to us? What do we choose to achieve? Absolutely. So um, within the context of accomplishment in the course, we, among others, we explore the concept of uh, willpower as studied by psychologist Kelly McGonigal and mm -hmm. We also discuss ways to cultivate sustainable willpower so we can achieve goals that we most want to achieve in life in a way that's healthy and sustainable indeed. And we also discuss what it means to possess grit or the ability to persevere as studied by a psychologist Angela Duckworth, whom you mentioned earlier. And we do two exercises to test our grit. And in addition, we also explore a method to successfully achieve goals based on a book that I wrote, which I'm currently translating from Dutch into English. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, as a seven, I would say, I, I'm just going to guess here, and I'm going to pick on myself, I guess, as a type seven, as I think sevens probably stand furthest away from grit as their kind of natural, uh, natural way of being. But what's also true, at least in, in my case, um, is, uh, you know, tremendous willpower when I, when I want it. And I, and I love McGonagall's work. I love how the concept, you can actually build willpower. So the, the, the brain science on this is, is fairly demonstrative that you can build willpower. You can build a brain that actually gets better at impulse control, impulse resistance over time, at, uh, at really focusing on the achievement of what you want and sticking with it. And of course, Angela's, Angela Duckworth's work on the way in which you then stick with it, which is one of the things we try to pass on to our children. And that, that's the hard part. Like, how do you get, how do you get, how do you train the kids 
for grit, but it's something we we're working on constantly because you know, the kids don't want to, the kids don't want to have grit. They don't want to play the piano one more time or do the jujitsu one more time or whatever. So it's a constant resistance. <laughs> yeah. And I could imagine that I don't know how this is for you, Rob, but that for this generation growing up with all of the, um, all of the distractions that it might be even more difficult because for instance, smartphones are so easy to pick up and then you're down a rabbit hole uh, instead of perhaps indeed practicing something that you would actually uh, prefer doing. So how, what's your experience with children and, and indeed distractions? At the well, I, you know, as, as we know, even adults are failing at this. We, the, you have a very hard time fighting the experiment or the, or the, uh, the, the power of an AI based, algorithm that can learn in real time and be deployed across an experiment of a billion and a half people like you can with Facebook. So if you just think about that's what's on the other side of your experience, it's no wonder they're winning because that's a very hard thing to, to match your individual psychology against when that's what's coming at you. So my belief on this for 10 years, ever since I did my TED talk to some degree on this, it was actually on a whole bunch of things, but this was one of the components was, you know, you, you, you can't expect your 11 year old to win that battle when even your, your self-aware 35 year old can't win the battle. So what you need to do is you need to create an environment where to some degree you're protecting that until developmentally the capacity for the impulse control, the capacity for the constant feedbacks that are the notifications, the constant dopamine hits that are the likes on Facebook or whatever it is, Instagram or whatever the kids are using now, there's a, there's a time and a place for, for them to transition developmentally, I think, into that. But by the way, this is not just apply to the kids, it applies to us too, as you say. It's like, we're all distracted with this crap. And it, it, it does become a, a practice of vigilance with respect to saying, okay, did I just, and, and I use Twitter, I don't, I'm not on Facebook, haven't been for years, but I, I am on Twitter. So I'm constantly asking myself, you know, what's the give, give and take here? Am I, did Twitter make me its tool? Or is Twitter my tool? I'm constantly in that question. I'm constantly reminding my friends and followers on Twitter of that exact question. Like, you know, we need to use these platforms as tools. We need to not become their tools. Um, and that requires a level of self-awareness. And again, not to plug the course, but just generally speaking about inner to life and inner life practice more broadly, like, like this is the level of self-awareness I think we need to have as adults. And we need to, speaking about kids, pass on to kids. We need to help our kids have almost like a proto ILP so they can be start to cultivate the skills of self-awareness that say, you know, have I, have I given up my agency here? Am I, am I still an, an autonomous agent that has its own dignity, its own self-worth in this system that wants to turn me into a, you know, wants to turn me into uh, basically just another, uh, you know, component of attention in their, in their business model. That, that's tricky. And that's certainly, I mean, clearly we see that is one of the, the things, you know, hurting society and democracies and, you know, all these other things. So it's, it, it's a life condition that we're having to serve. Yeah. And that's a very, uh, very lucid take on that. And I, I think indeed, if we're speaking about accomplishment, then that's one of the confounding factors of achieving goals is if, if there's indeed, uh, if there are distractions that are engineered to distract us, like Tristan Harris says, indeed, with, with uh, uh, all of these very smart people designing addictive tech. So um, That's right. Agree. That's right. Uh, and that brings us to uh, vitality, which, of course, is, um, as I said, you know, and you mentioned the, the drinking and the food and the habits. So, so let's talk about vitality. Indeed. So in the course, um, when we get to vitality, we explore healthy eating and drinking habits, indeed. And we do a series of physical exercises. And we also get to meet two friends of mine who are former martial arts champions who do uh, who tell us about nutrition and, and exercise. And we explore how to get good sleep. And we discuss why drinking alcohol might sometimes leave you feeling thirsty uh, instead of uh, refreshed. And in addition, throughout the course, we also discuss some neurobiology and we do a number of exercises uh, related to stress and relaxation and also shadow work. 
No, that's lovely. Yeah. One of the things that people ask me, Hey, what, what, what's one change I can make that will make me feel better immediately. I say, drink more water. It is a little simple thing, but you know, two thirds of the population, two thirds of adults are, are chronically dehydrated. It's like, just drink more water. You know, you'll find your energy levels going up. And, and I guess that's the point is that you've done a really good job of bringing in a lot of that upper right, these upper right components that really are the foundation. And again, speaking about somebody who's got a 13 year old who likes to, you know, stay up late on the computer. It's like, I'm constantly working with him to go, okay, are you really wanting to sacrifice tomorrow for another hour tonight? And that's really the choice because you wake up tired, sluggish, you don't do your best, et cetera. And again, there's just another habit to build. Yeah. Yeah. One of the ways I tend to think of that is that if we think of some personalities so that our self is composed of, of multiple tinier personalities that sometimes take the forefront, then we could say that um, we're choosing to deprive our future self by um, gorging our uh, present self indeed. And, and that can be a way of, of thinking about that. So um, I love that. I, I, often, I often say that if you want to know the decision somebody made yesterday, look at them today. Um, or the, the opposite is if you want to, uh, you know, the mindset you have today is what will determine what you look and feel like tomorrow. Um, and that's puts a lot of responsibility then on taking, okay, what's actually going on inside me now in terms of, well, all the things we're talking about. Sure. So I want to jump into what I think is, I, I love everything we've talked about already. Like I, I'm a geek about this stuff, but I, I think the practice part of this course is really cool. So I want to, I want to dive into practice. I'm, I'm watching the clock. I know that we've got maybe 30, 33 minutes. I want to leave some time for questions. So we'll go through this fairly quickly. But I want to just mention that the way you did practices um, is really cool. And, and, and so just walk us through real quick some of the practices that you, you did. And then I'm going to probably pull out some as well just to highlight you know, how you touched on states. And just a really cool approach, I thought. Okay. Okay. So one of the exercises we do um, is the play history exercise. And uh, it's quite a fun exercise. And basically you're invited to draw an overview of all of the activities that you love to do when you were younger as a child. Mm -hmm. And then you choose from these activities, one activity that you would like to do again now as an adult. And it's basically a way of bringing some fun from the past into the present. So mm -hmm. that's one of the exercises. And we also and just on that, but just to interrupt a little bit, like, so I've watched my, I've watched my mother-in-laws and her friends all start painting rocks again. And I don't know, maybe this is a thing because there's a lot of rock painting seemingly going on, but it, it speaks to that. Like there's a way in which I think people are reaching back into an earlier time where they had fun and they weren't as, uh, it wasn't as crafted and they're just doing these things and, and she loves it. I mean, it's just, she's doing it all the time. She finds it really engaging. Oh, that's wonderful. And perhaps people are also reaching back to things we used to do before the inventions of television and the internet. Yeah, right. Things like that. Right. Yeah. That's nice. And indeed, uh, um, in, in addition, we also do a, a deathbed visualization exercise. And um, that might sound a little unsettling at first, but uh, many people actually find it to be really mm -hmm. valuable. And, and the idea is that you visualize yourself on your deathbed, of course, at a ripe old age. And then you look back on a life full of meaningful memories. And what that helps you to do is to identify all of the meaningful things that you would still like to do with the life ahead of you. So that's uh, another exercise. Deathbed exercises are one of my favorite. I've, I've done them for years. I love them. They're, they're great. Um, I, find, I, I find they don't at all for me and, and many of the people I think do them, they don't at all create any sort of anxiety about death. In fact, if anything, they, they do the opposite. They kind of liberate one sense of life uh, and, and de, they defang the, any anxiety around death because you realize, oh, I'm choosing life and this is how and his is why. Yeah, indeed, I agree. And um, so an another exercise that we do is um, we invite participants to reach out to three people who know you well uh, so loved ones, colleagues, um, friends and family. And we ask, uh, or we ask you to ask those people to give you feedback about your greatest strengths and talents. Mm -hmm. So you ask, where did you see me um, performing a strength or, or displaying a strength? And, uh, and then we ask them to give a concrete example. So um, 
what this produces is that people receive typically three really nice pieces of feedback uh, about themselves. And the exercise also tends to deepen the relationships that the, that you have with the people whom you approach for the feedback. Yeah, that's really neat. Uh, we total side note, but inner life built a little platform to do this to, to, to give uh, your, give people that you care about in your life, feedback and love. We called it a mirror. So in a mirror.com uh, where you can, you just, it's just a way of spreading love. That's all it is. Um, because, because of exactly that. It's so nice to be able to reflect to someone. We talked about, we talk about social media. We talk about the distractions and some of the negative news we all see. Well, what if we continue to turn the internet into a place for sending love, which is really important. And so I, I, you know, that, 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 I love that practice too. And interestingly, the, um, if you ask people, and I've done this with, with classes of, uh, of students, if you ask people how often they give negative feedback to people when, for instance, they say that they don't like things about uh, behavior, then it tends to be more often uh, than if I ask them how often they give positive feedback mm. about um, behaviors. And it's just a way of, of also becoming aware that sometimes it can, be, it can feel a bit vulnerable to express appreciation towards others and um and to make that more comfortable is also one of the reasons why we do the exercise yeah and, and again just for everybody that's listening um even if you don't take the course I, I hope that you're getting some some ideas of how you can walk away and apply some of these kinds of activity activities or ideas in your life so that uh the next week month or what have you can start to come a little bit more alive. Uh, these are very concrete, practical things that you can that you can take on. Um, any other practices that that you want to share? And then I'll I'll, I'll mention a few just because I okay. I think they're cool. Well, one um, you mentioned states, and there's, there's um, an exercise um, that many people have also enjoyed is a, is a guided visualization exercise that takes you on a tour from the beginning of the universe to the formation of galaxies and stars <laughs> to the formation of the Earth and its inhabitants um, all the way to the present moment. And the goal of the exercise is to provide participants with, uh, if possible, an intense personal experience of the intimate relationship that each of us has with the entire universe. And, and of course, also um, with each other. Yeah. So that's another one that I, I personally uh, also like. I, I love that. And I love, I love, I mean, Ken's writing is no better. There's nobody better on this writing wise than Ken, the idea that the universe is in you in a holonic sense, like genuinely speaking, you're not only the most significant thing in the known universe, but all of the fundamental nature of the universe, everything is fundamental in the holonic layers is also in you. That's, that's, that's your composite being. So literally the universe is inside you. Um, and that's, that's gorgeous. And, um, that sort of state shifting awareness, uh, is, is really powerful. I'll just mention a couple of others that you've got here. You know, you did, you've got activities on emotional and mental awareness, existential awareness. I think that's kind of what we were just referring to. It may be a different practice, but I mean, that kind of awareness, witness awareness, unity awareness, you get into types around, uh, you have practices around types, communion and agency, uh, the big five types, which is my favorite personality model. Um, you get into, into levels, you have practices around shifting into lower levels versus shifting into later levels or higher levels. Um, you've also organized the practices by quadrant. So we've mentioned some of the stuff that's in the upper right, <coughs> excuse me, in the upper left, the lower left, contribution in the lower right um, and the deathbed, the superhero exercise, the golden shadow and dark shadow exercise. I mean, these, this is why when somebody, you know, when we first looked at the course and said, well, how do we position it? It, it was like, God, there's just, there's a lot here. There's so many cool things. It's actually quite hard to, to, to unpack it, but you know, you've really done a, a nice job. I want to, I want to congratulate you, but I, I love how the integral model does actually give a really beautiful, Kind of indexing system to hold all the things that are actually going on. I so, agree. And yeah, yeah, yeah go sorry, ahead. Sorry, sorry. Please. 
No, I, I was going to say that one of the things that integral theory does is it allows us to see how everyone is right, but partially right. And when you were speaking about types, one of the things I, I personally uh, really enjoyed about making the types module is how in the culture war currently, um, many people are going at each other's throats about uh, the differences between sex and gender and, and things like that. And if you introduce integral theory into the conversation, everybody can be right and can have their place across mm. the quadrants and can, and it's just a way of sort of alleviating the tension between seemingly um, paradoxical uh, perspectives, which actually fit together uh, perfectly if you look at it from a broader perspective. And I, one of the things I try to point out to folks is that in some ways at root, it can actually be really legitimately and, 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 and uh, sort of justifiably selfish in the sense that this is what you want to experience. Don't, don't worry about fixing other people, you know, allow this framework, the integral framework to heal the lack of joy in you when you see the otherness. And what happens as you do that, as you have that kind of selfish, uh, you know, motivation, I'm using selfish is probably not the right word, but when you're saying, well, actually, I want to heal myself first, you become trans, you become a transformative agent yourself, because you're no longer operating from fear, you're able to empathically relate, you're able to have more compassion for otherness, and you're able to serve in a very different way with love that helps others become less fear, fearful. And, and so speaking to what you just said is actually really, really important is that it's not just about kind of healing the world. It can also be, boy, wouldn't it be nice if I use this to bring all of this alive within myself and then I become the agent of, of transformation. Well said. So I've said before, the way we summarize the course is you sort of build a, this psychoactive mind of integral flourishing. Um, it brings in, you know, higher functioning, more meaningful engagements, deeper connections, more flow oriented activities. Uh, I think that it can work quickly. As we've said, this, 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 this stuff can happen, you know, within an hour, uh, two hours today, this week. And it can also work you know, as you build this, this mind of flourishing over time. Is there anything else that you would add to that? Well, I, I like that framing that, that, that you spoke about earlier also is that it's psychoactive. So you, you sort of acquaint yourself with the, with the terrain and in some intriguing way, the theoretical frameworks influence our behavior and mm -hmm. It's, it's as if the clearer we see the map, the easier it is to navigate towards our highest potential within that map. Yeah. So that's, um, that's in relation to indeed the, the psychoactive nature. And another thing I would add is that um, it can be quite powerful to share your experiences of the exercises with others. And that's why for people who are taking the course, we'll provide them with access to a, a private um, group uh, where they can come together with other participants and uh, discuss theories and practices uh, in the course. Yeah, that's, that's really lovely. Um, so he, this is a moment where with the remaining uh, 20 minutes, and we can stay over for, for a little bit, but I want to re be respectful of everybody's time. Um, this is a moment where I'm going to uh, provide a little bit of instructions. If you want to start, uh, you, the, 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 the folks listening in, uh, want to participate with some uh, questions. Uh, if you have any questions, there are two ways to engage. Uh, first, you can click the raise hand button, which will tell us uh, you want us to turn on your camera and have some real-time discussion. Or you can submit a written question by clicking the Q&A button and we will read it on air. Um, there is, uh, so as those things are beginning to, uh, beginning to come in, um, I will just ask, Lee, one final question of my own, which is, you know, what would you, what would you say directly to you, to listeners right now about, you know, people who have maybe taken a human development course, what, what this might contribute to them? That, that's a good question. Well, I, I would say that 
as we've been saying um, throughout this um, this webinar, is that the course essentially represents 24 years of my professional life, and it combines many of my most important insights and experiences and knowledge. So in a way, it's a life's work in a single course. And um, people who've taken earlier versions of this course, they've typically received a great deal of value. And as you said, it's, it's quite a humongous course, and it consists of 83 videos, 17 audio exercises, and 64 other practical exercises, which are all intended to help people enhance their well-being, increase their resilience, and, and deepen their self-insight. So if you take the course, you'll, you'll discover that it really is about you, about who's, whoever's taking it as the participant, and about how you can optimize the quality of your life in a practical way. And based on the experiences of participants in previous versions of the course, um, it's perhaps a very British way of saying it, but I, I feel confident in claiming that if you follow this course from start to finish and you do all of the exercises, then you'll likely be very satisfied with the results that you experience in your life. Lovely. All right. Well, that's a, that's a great place to jump into Q&A. And, and probably should mention, Lee, um, while we're here, that... Um, uh, it is a, you, you, you are, you plan on having a, uh, private discussion group that is, is associated with the course as well. Yes. The thing is, one of the things people really enjoy is not just to experience their own, um, or to have their own experiences of the exercises, but also to, to resonate with others. And I mean, you, you and I've seen this throughout the integral life practice sessions is that the most lively aspects of those sessions are typically where participants are interacting with each other around uh, particular themes. And the same thing has been my experience with um, courses that I've taught and, and developed is that when people get together and they're engaged together around these themes that can really produce some, some, um, some interior magic uh, between mm -hmm. people. So that's one of the things we would like to offer indeed, yes. And is that something you'll be uh, participating in or, or contributing in any way to? Yes. Yeah, so, so the way um, I could see it in, indeed sort of being um, a practice group where I, um, where I just set the, the, set the stage and perhaps give some, uh, mm -hmm. some exercise instructions or we go through some of the exercises that people have already done. And um, it's it's basically then I'll be mostly facilitating in the sense that um, it's about the people who are taking the course and about their experiences. And of course, if they have questions, then they can ask them. Uh, and um, sometimes when I've done these previously, some of the most interesting answers to questions come from the people who are on sure. the call. Yeah, of course. So, um, of course. Yeah. All right. Well, let me, uh, let me just read some of the questions. Uh, so, all right, uh, Scott asks, suggestions on maintaining and enhancing relationships with people who are not pursuing integral studies as I slash we change and the people we relate to do not. Mm. Well, that's an interesting question, Scott. And I know that some people, some people suggest that you should sort of carve out your own path through life and follow your own path of development and leave people behind uh, who don't, who are unable to keep up with you. But my experience has been that, or at least my perspective is, is that we share with people in our lives aspects of ourselves and that if we're able to develop ourselves and to remain in contact with people and continue to share what we shared with them, that we also honor parts of ourselves um, that we perhaps no longer feel um, attracted to as we used to, but that are still part of ourselves. So I'm, I'm, I would say that if you can continue to relate to people from your past based around the things that energized you in the past together, um, that you can actually be a role model for people in the way that you then embody the change that you uh, are seeking and are, uh, are creating in your own life. So I'm not sure if that's sufficient answer. Rob, do you have any? Uh, 
but it's something we it's, it's a great question it's something we actually see a lot in our community for reasons that Scott is alluding to that what happens when somebody joins integral life I mean we, we, you know when people on our join integral life page I say look I promise you you're going to grow here I don't promise stuff lately like I'm a kind of a no-nonsense guy in that sense I'm a highly integrity filled guy when I say something and I mean it and I mean it like you're going to grow you're, if you actually participate with us at all over the course of a couple of years you're going to grow up a lot you're going to wake up a lot you're going to clean up a lot. And you're going to show up a lot. Even if, even if to some degree, you don't totally mean to, like you're going to listen to stuff. It's going to intrigue you. You're going to do some practices. Like it's going to happen. And what happens when, when that happens is exactly what Scott's alluding to. You, you, you have somebody that may be being left behind a little bit. The thing is though, because you change and you're becoming more compassionate, you're becoming more skillful, you're becoming more open and aware. You also see all the ways that you contribute to the very things you think's wrong with them. <laughs> Like, it's not just about them not growing up. It's also about your participation in the ways that you're not empathizing enough, that you're projecting. You are bringing your own shadow into it. And the thing that I've noticed is that as you do that, as you become more skillful, as you become more compassionate, as you become more loving, as you become more capable of staying in intimate contact, that person comes with you to some degree. That person often feels like you've created a space where the, the fear and the contempt and the, and the defense mechanisms often kind of come down. Now, I'm not saying that's a universal story. I mean, certainly it's just, you know, there are cases where people just grow apart because one person is growing a lot faster and the other person, for whatever reason, is not going to, 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 to do that. But um, there's also the other beautiful story where actually one person acts as a kind of a gravitational magnet for the growth of someone else. And it is their very commitment. I'll, I'll use marriage like that lifelong commitment that, that constantly reminds you to come back to the practice of staying in touch with that. And that very commitment of who am I in this? What, did, what am I doing? Um, becomes the role model you're talking about, Lee. That, that was very beautifully said, Robin, and, and a, a very nice translation of what I was trying to say. So, um, and, and indeed, I would add to that, that, of course, uh, an exception would be if you're dealing with people who, um, who suffer from personality disorders or sure. things like that, where, where, of course, the relationship is destructive for you and potentially for the other person. But I, I find that a very beautiful framing, Rob, where you stay true to your own development and try to relate to people uh, from there, no matter how far or high you're uh, developing. Yeah. And I think one of the main, probably one of the main distinctions in relationships that are able to go on that journey versus those that aren't is, is because, I mean, a lot of people are getting married in their early 20s. None of us know who we are in our early 20s, right? We make commitments that to some degree are much bigger than us, and they kind of have to drag us along and we either grow into them or we don't. But one thing that sits at the core, I think, of successful relationships in the integral life community and those who aren't is do they have some basic foundational commitment to each other's growth and their own? Meaning, are they at least open-minded enough to, to, be, to, to be present for that? And um, if someone is dealing with a lot of shadow, they're dealing with a lot of trauma, they're dealing, as you say, with you know, certain kinds of, uh, of, of dysfunctions, that just need a lot more work or a lot more therapy or what have you. Well, sometimes that can be, you know, that, that's, that uh, there's a lot more professional work, professional uh, therapy that might need to be done. But, but for those who share some part of each other's growth and awakening as, as a component, uh, it, 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 it can work really well. All right. Let me, let me jump into the next question. Uh, Marcy asks, how would you characterize the difference or sameness of resiliency and flourishing? So resilience versus flourishing. So that's, that's uh, another very good question. And I think that we could perhaps say that, um, that resiliency is, is almost a trait that we can develop and cultivate, whereas um, flourishing is the result of, um, of 
certain actions that we take and certain um, attitudes that we cultivate. So, so that, that would be where I would start. Um, and resiliency is, or anti-fragility, or how, however you want to frame it, is, um, is basically, I would say, our capacity to meet adversity with flexibility and to stay true to ourselves regardless of uh, disturbing circumstances mm -hmm. and to bounce back from from challenges and to overcome obstacles and things like that and um, so I would say that resiliency is something if we're looking at the perma plus v model for instance I, I would say we could perhaps fit resiliency within the accomplishment um, uh, category as something that can help you to achieve goals and to um, to stay on the path that you've chosen for yourself. So that yeah. would be my reply. Rob? That's great. Well, I, my answer would be, would be similar, I think, just in the sense that when you, when you do the skill building that you're offering here uh, in the context of the PERMA-V model or quadrants, what have you, that skill building itself becomes the way in which you're, res you're resilient. Um, you are your happiness set point, for example, that thing you tend to go back to after you get punched um, that's something that you're going to have a easier time doing when you are flourishing and it's going to be easier to flourish when you are doing the very things we're talking about, the very activities. And it sounds stupid, but like, Hey, drinking water, getting the good night's sleep, spending some energy, you know, walking, uh, being in gratitude, staying connected with loved ones, doing purposeful work, being in flow. It's not to suggest it's just a checklist, but if you're doing that, if you're in flourishing and you get punched with the bad news or the thing that wants to take you out of resilience, guess what? You're a hell of a lot more resilient. It's just, that's just a fact. So I would say they're actually quite intimately related. They're not exactly the same concept, but they're quite intimately related. Well said, I like that. Um, I think Tom asks a great question here, which, which I'm, I'm really glad he asked it. He says, look, the content, the amount of content sounds overwhelming. How would you recommend pacing the content and, 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 and tips on the right timing? And I, I was going to actually ask you this. Is there a way in which people can look at the course and go, okay, I'm going to touch in here. I mean, maybe I do the introduction, but I'm going to kind of bounce around a little bit based on what I feel is calling me or is, is up for me at a given time or is there a different way that you would suggest uh, d digesting it? Well, that's a, another great question. Um, th the way I set it up is that it is, it is linear and chronological. So, so um, the modules or the units, they are um, sequential and they do build on each other. So I do refer to um, earlier things in later modules. So, but of course you can also bounce around. It's, it's a question of what you're comfortable with and what your ultimate goal is with, with the course, of course. Um, Somebody might come in already knowing a fair amount about the integral model, for example, and go, you know, I really want to work on purpose, which is another question. So I'll go ahead and just, add, I'll just refer to this. Who said, you know, this person said, I came in late as purpose addressed in the course. The answer is yes, but, but, but yeah, so you come in, you say, well, I really want to work on purpose. So now I'm going to go to that section of the course. I'm going to do that. Um, and then, and then maybe I go, I go elsewhere. I'm not, what you're saying is, well, yeah, but you wouldn't want to do that unless you had the overview of what perma V was. And you want to obviously understand the integral stuff, but somebody could um, go to different aspects if they had more of a sense of what they, what they needed. Well, absolutely. And I think we're also, um, that it's also a personality type thing again, because as you said earlier, I've, I've set the course up very methodically. And that's also because I tend to do that <laughs> myself. So if I'm reading, I, I tend to read from start to finish. And if I'm watching a film and it doesn't really, uh, and it doesn't really interest me that much, I'm, I tend to give it a chance and sort of watch it to the end. So that is also a personality type trait. Um, so I find this a, a difficult question to answer because, um, of course, you can you can pick and choose, uh, and you'd lose some of the linear consistency, which is of course no problem. Um, but but I think there is something to be said to follow it 
consecutively in the sense that it's it is like a story and mm. um and it does build on each other but but again that might also be my personal preference so um, sure well let's 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 go to the timing thing because that's the other part of the question is okay so somebody's going to do it beginning to end are we talking about you know two weeks 30 days 60 days i mean there's obviously a lot of different ways that somebody could could take it down you could do it the whole thing fast and then kind of go back through methodically so what, what do you think there well i think it's good to have enough time to um to assimilate all of the information to let it really sink in and to do the exercises um so if we're speaking about time i would actually say take a couple of months at least to um to engage with the material and um but then again that's also very uh, individual based because some people are, are extremely fast um, information intake as I, I imagine you for instance reading multiple books uh, at the same time and then really um, devouring them is that is that true yeah I, I have a yeah I'm a, yeah a lot, lot of books <laughs> so um, so I would say that also depends on what you would like but let's say if, if we look at the units then um, Corey set it up that there's um, uh, 14 modules or 14 um, units. If you take one to two weeks for each of those units, then I think that's that's a, a nice tempo that gives everyone uh, enough time to do the exercises, assimilate, assimilate the uh, the information, and also let it sink in. Uh, yeah. Indeed. And just to put it in perspective, I mean, a, a given module might actually only be in terms of actual elapsed time of content, maybe 15 or 20 minutes of, of investment, depending on how long the media is or how long the, the, the practice is. But, but the, in terms of the time commitment, somebody could probably pace that based on what they, what they were feeling you know, drawn to. Um, let's see, so we talked about resilience. Um, oh, I think I, I'm just, I'm, I'm looking at the queue to make sure I, did I get any other questions? Okay. It good. Well, and we're coming up right on the, right on the, the half hour. So that was actually worked out well. If you have any final questions, please feel free to, <coughs> excuse me, uh, put them, put them in there and we'll try to answer in the last few minutes. One of the things I was going to mention also in terms of the pacing of the course or the, um, the way it lays out is, is Lee was uh, nice enough to prepare a, uh, a practice guidebook that gives you a sense of the overview of all the practices. And it's cool because it's by quadrants and states and types and, and that's, that's kind of neat. So you can get kind of an overview. Is there anything you want to say about that, Lee? Well, no, just to give you credit, it was your idea. It's, it's a wonderful idea because uh, one of the things I ran into is when you create a course like this, which is very broad and, and very deep, so it's a, a large scope, is how do, you, how do you then sort of bring everything together? So um, I, I had a system for that and, and you, you basically pointed me in a direction that could make it much more optimized and I, I really like that. So you suggested creating a practice book so people also have the practice book even if they finish the course and they can always go back to the practice book and, and see, for instance, I want to do an exercise related to mental intelligence today, or I want to do an exercise related to the lower left quadrant. Yep. And you can just look up one and you can do it if you want to. Yeah. 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 And as a seven, that's how, that's how I would use it. But <laughs> as you say, everybody's going to kind of approach their own transformative process differently. Um, so that's, yeah, that's cool. So just a couple of housekeeping items. So what we're doing is this is the launch weekend. We just, the course just went live this morning. Um, it's a $195 course. We are discounting it down to 125, uh, this weekend only. And of course, if you're an inner life member, you get another 25% off that. So it gets you right to the hundred dollar mark. So about, about half off, um, you know, candidly, we don't really make a lot of money on these kinds of things. We do it because we're trying to bring the best people in the community and their contribution to you in these different, you know, these different things, whether it be loving completely with Keith's course or flourishing with Lee's course or what have you, it gives you a way in which you have a broad catalog of things to choose from because we can't cover everything 
uh, with just our dialogues that we do on Inner to Life. We can't cover everything through Inner to Life practice. We also have a course catalog that you can then engage with at, in more deep dive areas that you want to. So just so you understand kind of the, the philosophy of how Inner to Life um, brings forward its, its offerings to our members. That is, um, that's what we do. And of course, you don't have to be a member to, to participate in the course as well. So with that, thank you for Lee first to you for uh, joining us on this. So this is really cool. It's always a lovely to uh, chat with you. And I, I hope that um, as people get to know you more, they will come to love you as we do. And um, uh, for anybody joining, um, joining us, thank you for participating and uh, feel free to uh, jump into the course. I think it's really going to be very, very valuable for you. Um, and I know we'll all stand by to support you in any way that we can. And of course, Lee will as well inside of the, uh, the private uh, discussion group for the course itself. So Lee, I'll let you take us out. Well, thanks Rob and, and Corey for uh, the t helping the technical uh, side of the webinar. And thanks everyone for attending. And um, I hope to see you all uh, on the course or during the integral life practice sessions that I also host. So thanks everyone. And thanks. For all right, everybody. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.